United States Differences That Count, which is coming out later this spring, of which I'm a co-editor. But today we're here, Fire and Ice Revisited, American and Canadian Social Values in the Age of Obama and Harper. And Michael Adams has been following trends and social trends and demographics and all these other words that he, he uses and I don't on how Canada and the United States or how Canada is changing, America is changing, and where they're coming together and apart. And it's fascinating stuff. And he was coming through Washington, and I said, please come. Um, glad you're here. And he's going to take us through some of the ideas. And really, he's open to questions, too. So over to you, Kay. Michael. All right. <laughs> well, thank you, David. And uh, he mentioned the book, Differences That Count. I think this is edition number three. Four. Number four. So it is, it is the book on Canada-U.S. differences and covers all the range of topics from the law to banking to, well, in my case, social values, public opinion, and all the various domains uh, that you would want to take a look at these two countries and differences that count. So um, I, another phrase for that is the narcissism of small differences. But sometimes those narcissistic small differences can be quite meaningful, as we know, when you can have a brother and a sister. and. People say, well, yeah, we're brother and sister, but we are completely different. <laughs> now, of course, we're all carbon-based creatures, and you know, there's a lot that we have in common, but the differences can be significant. And of course, we like those differences to be acknowledged from time to time and um, celebrate our similarities and also acknowledge those differences. Uh, it's, uh, I'm here uh, with my spouse and our kids, and uh, this is March break. And I thought we got to get those boys down to Washington, and we've got to, you know, we got to get them up to the Capitol, and we've got to get to the Library of Congress, Air and Space Museum. If you've got two boys, is a must, of course. And uh, we've just had a wonderful time going to the Lincoln Memorial and so on. And uh, it's, uh, I think I've been, of course, fascinated with the United States since probably grade nine or ten when we actually hit a course on American history, and uh, and I and I just. I thoroughly uh, I loved it, found it very interesting. I had cousins from Michigan, so I always wanted to know more about America than they did. Again, the classic Canadian stance is to be morally and intellectually superior to any of your American cousins. This is one of the, if they're gonna be superior in every other category, can we have a couple that we're, we're best in? Um, so it's, uh, I guess this is, uh, we're celebrating War of 1812-14. I've come across that a fair amount in the, in the uh, Smithsonian Institutes that we've been uh, uh, visiting. And, um, and uh, really, uh, I, I was thinking, given the context of, um, of the world today, that I'd much rather be a Canadian presenting in Washington than a Ukrainian presenting in Moscow. So <laughs> while we may have our differences from time to time, I don't know whether there's any other uh, great country that we'd rather be next door to than, than the United States and our cousins in the U.S. So um, I founded my company in 1970. Around 1995, someone asked me to write up a book about what I was finding. I did that. It was called Sex in the Snow, um, which I was willing to sell to the Winter Olympics, but they've never expressed any interest at all in that title, which I thought would be perfect for them as a motto, but I, I remain open to a, to a proposal. Um, and, uh, and then uh, we, uh, after doing a book about Canada, I then thought, well, maybe I should do a, something about Canada, U.S. And then we have 9-11, and then we have, that period then was not a great period for the kind of writing that I do. But uh, two or three years later, I was able to come up with a book on, on Canada and the United States, and that book was, was Fire and Ice. So what I'm doing today is that book came out in 2002, 2003, and uh, we've continued to track um, uh, the two countries. And today, I kind of am giving you an update report on uh, the two countries and the trajectories uh, that they are going in. And then afterwards, as David said, I'd be uh, really happy to, to to chat uh, about uh, what our findings are. So in 2003, when I came up with this book, uh, we had Mr. Bush, the President of the United States, we had Jean Chrétien, um, and a poll done by a colleague, Frank Graves at ECOS, uh, asked the Canadians in 2002 the question, uh, over the past 10 years, do you think Canada has become more like the United States, less like the United States, or has there been no change? 
And the Canadians at that time, 58% of us said, we're becoming more like the Americans, right? I mean, we shop in shopping centers. Uh, we feel guilty about not spending enough time with our parents or our children. I mean, you know, we're, we're, what's, what's, uh, what's different about these two people? No change, 31%, and 9% saw us as becoming increasingly distinct. So this, of course, inspires me to say, I've got some education to do here. I better, uh, I better write a book about this and find out whether or not the Canadian public opinion is correct or not. So the, the one question, if I were to be marooned on an island in the Pacific and I could only take one of my beloved questions with me for the rest of my life, it would be on the family, and be the fundamental institution in any society, and it would be on the structure of authority in the family. And the classic, now probably politically incorrect uh, phrase or statement is the father of the family must be the master in his own house just like spare the rod and spoil the child and all those other <coughs> things that maybe our grandparents believed and, and we may have come to question. So uh, we put this or inflict this question on random samples of Canadians, Americans and people around the world uh, every year or two and the question or the statement is the father of family must be master in his own house. So in 1992 when uh, we asked a random sample of Canadians this question, 26 percent of Canadians said that they thought the, uh, the father of the family must be master. Uh, we first asked the question in 1983, so it had gone from about 42 percent down to 26 percent, almost one or two percent a year uh, did it, uh, and that's just, you know, generational replacement. Uh, older people leaving who have those traditional values going to the great random sample in the sky, and then we bring young people in uh, to our sample from hell, I guess, or wherever they come, uh, into, uh, into um, a sample when they're age 15. And so every year you'd expect that kind of generational replacement. So then we did our first survey in the United States on our social value study, and uh, we found that 42% of Americans felt that um, the father of the family must be a master in his own house. So uh, with that observation, I remember uh, making a presentation in St. Louis, and a gentleman got up and he asked, Mr. Adams, did you only survey in Texas? And, uh, and I said, no, we've got all, we have 48 states in here. We, didn't, we don't have Alaska and Hawaii. And he said, well, you advertise that one in every 20 of your surveys is wrong, so you're probably wrong here. Go back in the field. So 96, uh, Canada is now down at 20% who believe the father should be master. And in the United States, it's 44%. So the gap is widening. <coughs> it seems odd. Because I thought, okay, well, in the year 1900, it would have been 98% of people in both countries, you know, with a suffragette here and there, maybe a, a, a disagreeing. So obviously, America must have been very high and then must have gone down and then now is coming back up again, maybe. So two observations is not enough. I needed another one. Uh, I don't know what's going on with Canadian men or what's wrong with them, but anyway, it's now down to 18% uh, who are uh, people who believe should be master. And America is now up to 49% who believe that the father of the family must be master in his own house. This highly correlates with a political predisposition to vote Republican. And indeed, 49% of people voted for George Bush when he was running against Al Gore. And uh, of course, Mr. Bush won that election. So this Say, I, seeing this, I said, I've got to figure out what is going on in these two cultures uh, and how, what does this correlate with and is there a larger story of social change going on in these two societies? So this was the thing that inspired me then to, to write that book. Now this is a little bit of a uh, Colbert um, uh, uh, segue into some of the differences between the two cultures historical, stereotypical differences. Uh, America being religious and Canada secular. Now this is quite a bit of a change because at the time that uh, the 13 colonies were getting together to break away from Britain, they actually went up to Quebec and asked Quebec to join the party. And Quebec said no because you're going to separate church and state and we want state religion here, Roman Catholicism. So no thank you. You can, you can have your separation of church and state. We're not interested. Uh, but things have changed over the last couple of hundred years with, of course, Canada 
uh, particularly Quebec, being very secular in orientation. Uh, Americans are classic risk-taking people. Uh, we are a risk-averse people, um, and this has all sorts of implications for things like innovation, uh, but also for the kinds of uh, averse, uh, aversion to risk-taking that uh, has us basically run by the banks of Canada, who have uh, we have saved us over the last four or five years. At least that's what they tell us. Uh, culture of aspiration. We're a culture of accommodation. The Canadian, of course, crosses the road to get to the middle. Uh, uh, money is everything. Uh, money is suspect. If you have money in Canada, it probably means you got a government grant you shouldn't have got, or you inherited it, you know, from your father. Uh, the idea that actually hard work would result in great material success is something that we're very suspicious of in Canada. Uh, winner takes all. Uh, we have more income redistribution. One, the top 1% we hear a lot about these days uh, in Canada controls uh, about 10% of the wealth of the country. In America, uh, the top 1% has 22% of the wealth of the country. So again, we are trending in the same direction as the United States, but uh, uh, only uh, half the uh, kind of wealth <coughs> concentration. Uh, Americans have the highest standard of living in the world, and we say, yeah, you can have the highest standard, but we have the best quality of life. Uh, Americans think they'll win the lottery. We think we will, we've won the lottery. Uh, the, basically, the job of a Canadian is to make sure that their mouth is open when the fruit falls from the tree into our mouth, so then we can feel righteous that we have deserved that, right? That we have, we've, of course, we're in Canada, so. Uh, Americans have capricious philanthropy. If you have a cause, make sure that Bill and Melinda Gates or somebody who's fabulously wealthy likes your cause and will support it. In Canada, of course, we have compulsory philanthropy called uh, taxation. And we give it to the government and they buy votes. So it's a different sort of uh, uh, way of distributing the, uh, the wealth of the nation. Uh, Americans are very strong on put down humor, slapstick, and so on. Uh, Canadians pride themselves uh, in, uh, in self effacing irony. I guess we inherited from the Brits, um, but uh, you have to start from a basically. Uh, uh, the, the only humor, the humor we like are the humor where we get the joke and we know that the other person doesn't get it, then we really feel good about that. So, so those, uh, those are kind of some stereo, Canadian U.S. stereotypes. Uh, this then leads to that book, Fire and Ice and the Myth of Converging Values, uh, and I was lucky enough to win the Donner Prize um, that year. Uh, now we're in 2013. Uh, we have Mr. Obama in the White House and Mr. Harper um, at 24 Sussex Drive. So does this indicate then that we have uh, changed places? So let's have a look at uh, some data that would give us an indication of whether or not that is the case. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this research methodology. This is, of course, should be relegated to the appendix of any book, but um, we are surveying here people's, not just the opinions, which are quite changeable, or the attitudes, which are a little more uh, fixed in our brains, but the values uh, of, uh, of the people, the mindsets, uh, how they make sense of the world that they're in. Uh, we have multiple statements to measure a particular value, and this is a presentation based on surveys done pretty well every presidential election year in the United States, every four years, and in uh, Canada every year since 1983. And we have about 60 values then that are being measured exactly the same way in uh, each of the countries. So examples of, of values, often you say a person you know, has good values or that person has no values. We all have values, it's just that some people value things that we don't like, like they think they can take your money from you physically, through physical force. We don't particularly admire that. Uh, but what we're trying to do is measure all the values that motivate us as parents, as, as employees, as, as investors, um, as spiritual beings, uh, as consumers, and so on. And of course, this we use uh, for <coughs> primarily uh, to serve our clients in, uh, in business. So these are examples then of the, of the uh, uh, values from acceptance of violence, American dream, you know what that is, flexible families, just desserts, 
obedience to authority, patriarchy, again, I talked about that earlier. Um, we have xenophobia. We're looking for a, a Z or a Z, anyone who can suggest a value that starts with that letter. Uh, there is a reward um, for that, but uh, we've been working on uh, trying to figure out a Z, but you can tell me after the, after the presentation today if you've got one for me. Uh, so religiosity, uh, basically this is a, how important religion is to you in your daily life. It's very interesting that Pew, uh, yesterday the Pew Center uh, came out with a, a great question. I love it. It's a question on uh, can you be a good person uh, if you don't believe in God? And this is, again, one of those that quite differentiates Canadians and Americans. Um, uh, I, it's almost like Canadians, Americans want freedom of religion and Canadians want freedom from, from religion. Uh, about two-thirds of Canadians actually think you can be good even if you don't believe in God, whereas the majority of the Americans think that you can't be a good person if you don't believe in God. That's a, that's a big, uh, a big uh, difference between the two. Um, and the items we use, you know, my religious beliefs are important to me and, and so on, and people have to agree or disagree with that. Uh, personal challenge, um, you know, in most of our history as humans, uh, personal challenge was making sure that we ran fast enough to catch dinner and, and ran fast enough also not to be dinner. Uh, and, and so every day's life, personal challenge was not an issue. But in this uh, era in which we have moved up the Maslowian hierarchy and we don't have to worry about, uh, most of us at least, basic needs, uh, then we have to set challenges for ourselves. So this personal challenge would be, you know, I often just do something just to prove to myself that I can do it or climb a mountain or jog every day or whatever. Setting yourself goals to, uh, to uh, prove that you are um, capable of, of achieving them. Uh, acceptance of violence as normal in everyday life. This is of course, a very interesting one. We have four statements on that one. Violence is, can it be exciting? So that's, that has a use as uh, something that's amusing for us. Uh, it, if you can't take it and you just let off steam, that's the catharsis theory of violence. Uh, violence is no big deal. It's just everyday life. So that's a normative violence that's all around us and there's nothing unusual about it. Or it's acceptable to use physical force to get something that you want. So this is instrumental violence. So we, we really have some very powerful measures that we aggregate to have one measure, which is acceptance of violence as normal in everyday life. Just desserts is, uh, this is, I just love this one because it is another one that differentiates uh, uh, political ideology. Um, and it's, it's also referred to as the just world theory. Uh, and that is, it's, is, is this the just world we live in or is it not just? Um, are people, um, do people get what they deserve or not in life? So for a, a culture, uh, Calvinism is, of course, uh, the belief that um, in this world you will, if you have virtue, you will be successful. And if you don't, uh, if you aren't successful, it is the proof of lack of virtue. So that's a very, if, if people have that view of life, uh, then it, it's very different than those who think actually uh, success has no correlation with, with virtue whatsoever and a, a lot has to do with the luck of your birth and who were your parents and so on. So it's, and, and one is a, a, an ideology that very much is behind liberalism and another one is an ideology that's very much behind a conservative point of view. And uh, again, these are kind of you trying to dig into what are the roots of, of, of political ideologies. And, and so this is a, a very important one for us. Um, and then this leads to a sociocultural map. People who have traditional values at the top, people who reject those and are more individualistic in, in rejecting those values. At the left side of the map is, are those with a survival of the fittest orientation and on the right hand side are people with an orientation to personal fulfillment. So uh, in the upper left hand quadrant we have people who are oriented to traditional authority but are also kind of a, in, into a Darwinistic survival of the fittest orientation and their orientation of life is status and security and obedience to traditional norms and uh, structures. In the upper right we have uh, people whose mental posture we characterize as authenticity and responsibility, well-being, harmony, and uh, responsibility is their orientation. And then fulfillment and individualism 
In the lower right quadrant is idealism. This is secular idealism and, and personal autonomy. These people are into exploration in life and flexibility. And then the lower left are people kind of alienated from all other three quadrants. They feel excluded from the society and its norms and values. And in their own personal life, they are pursuing intensity almost on a, a daily or hourly uh, basis. Uh, if you uh, look at status and security here with some of the symbols of that. Uh, American dream is being pursued by following accepted norms and rules. <clears throat> you move up the hierarchy. It's a status hierarchy and, and when I was growing up it would be you start with a Buick. No, you start with a Chevy or a Ford. You move up to a Buick or an Olds mobile and then you end up with a Cadillac that you drive up and down Collins Avenue in Miami. And so there are, and, and there are symbols all the way up the status hierarchy, and the material symbols are symbols of your success in moving up that status hierarchy. Strong work ethic, you work hard and you get rewards, uh, and, you, and, and your material success uh, uh, indicates your social standing, and you're, you have a strong belief in traditional institutions <coughs> and identities. Uh, real men, real women, moms, dads, roles are there, and they should be the model that we all aspire to. Authenticity and responsibility. Here we have a strong, strong sense of responsibility to other people. Uh, care deeply about ethics and, uh, and fair-mindedness. Uh, these are the soccer moms and the dads who coach Little League. Uh, these are the people who watch Oprah and are comforted uh, with her show. And uh, care for mo body, mind, and spirit, like the motto of the YMCA, body, mind, spirit, and so on. And, and facing daily challenges. The idealism and autonomy quadrant, these are self-reliant and in control people, idealistic and open-minded. A lot of these are baby boomers who came of age in the 60s. This is the people who embraced feminism, who first became aware of environmentalism, read Rachel Carson's uh, uh, book, and, um, um, and then of course, uh, we're very much inspired by the civil rights movement and the and justice and treating ethnocultural minorities with, uh, uh, with equality and so on. So they reject uh, outdated norms, or what they think are outdated norms and, uh, and institutions. And then the exclusion and intensity quadrant, these people take risks and challenges just for the thrill of it. You know, drive through a red light at four in the morning and see if you, you make it, it's, and then if you do, you celebrate. Uh, flaunting one's material success and possessions, uh, craving constant attention and excitement and distraction, living on the edge with risky uh, anti-conformist behavior. So those, that's kind of the Enveronic Social Values 010. That's the template upon which then we will have a look at uh, the data on these two cultures. So in 1992, the average American, so this is, this is the sample of 2000 or whatever we had that year, answering all of our questions. And we, by computer, can torture the data till it tells the truth about where is that culture that year on the map. So this is the average American. Now, if we had the answers from all 2,000 people, each one would be a dot on the map, and then it would be very dense, you know, where, where the average would be. But there are, you know, people all over the map. It's just that the average American in 92 was just inside the authenticity and responsibility quadrant. Then in 96, we saw a movement down the map, so away from authority toward individuality, but a, from fulfillment heading more toward a survival orientation. And then in 2000, so that was the, this, these were, again were the studies that I used as the basis then for that Fire and Ice book. Well, in 2004, we found America here, so this is after 9-11, so moving a bit up the map toward, um, toward authority. 2007, even further up the map. And then the surprise was the study we did in 2012, which finds America kind of, it really bothers people like me to see this because culture should be headed on a, in a trajectory that's sort of unidirectional, right? Because we're thinking that that's, that's where cultures go. And here's a culture whose values seem to have moved toward the center of the map. So this, um, as, that's why I'm giving you this interim report because I'm not about to write a book about that. I need another observation to find out whether or not 
in 2016, where will America be on the map? The Canadians then, in 92, were here, 96, 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012. So here is a culture that is on a unique and, and consistent trajectory deeper into the quadrant of idealism and autonomy. And it's interesting, the, th the theory has always been that Canadians are going to follow the Americans, the, the little country, the little sister is going to follow the big brother eventually because they're so big and powerful and their culture is so powerful. And here's a case where you actually have a hypothesis that America is becoming a bit Canadian which perished the thought, as my grandmother would say, that this could possibly be. And, uh, we, um, and, and so uh, this is actually the theme then of the chapter that I've written for David's book. Well, uh, then I said just uh, to my colleagues, give me a list of the top 10 values that differentiate Canadians and Americans, and the ones where they're furthest apart, and then, and then, which, and then tell me which country is the, mo is the strongest on that value. So the strongest value in differentiating Canadians and Americans is flexible families. This is Adam and Steve as well as Adam and Eve, right? This is, this is the whole same-sex marriage thing and so on. And, it's the, and so Canadians are much stronger on the acceptance of this diversity in the family than are Americans. Then what's stronger, the second most powerful thing is the belief that your country is a great country and Americans have a strong sense of national pride and that differentiates them from the Canadians. A fear of violence is the third value and much stronger in the United States than in Canada. Uh, ecological concern is the fourth one and it is stronger in Canada. Um, some Americans might say, well, since you're going out of your way to ruin the environment of the planet, no wonder you're concerned about the ecology. Uh, that would be a probably an appropriate uh, observation for some Americans to make about the Canadians, but it is a strong value. And clearly one that, uh, you know, Stéphane Dion ran on the green shift, he didn't win, uh, but the idea that the Canadians, you know, are no longer in Kyoto and actually always get the award for the worst country in the world for what it should be doing on the environment has got a lot of Canadians probably concerned. And so there's, you would think there's some potential for a Canadian leader to be able to leverage that and say, isn't it time that we at least f felt righteous about ourselves, even if we don't do anything about it? Just why don't we say that we care? Anyway, it's, it's out there for some politician to, uh, to exploit. Work ethic is very strong in the United States, uh, stronger than um, in Canada. Spiritual quest, of, uh, spiritual meaning, and so not only religiosity is stronger, but the whole thing, uh, uh, the whole quest for, for uh, spiritual uh, well-being is stronger in the United States. Propriety is doing the right thing on the right occasion, wear the right suit, wear the right clothing, and so on. Interesting, the Canadians are more informal in that regard. Americans much more oriented to the proper dress for the occasion. Uh, religiosity, of course, stronger in the United States. That makes sense. Uh, patriarchy, father is master. Of course, we've seen those numbers. And, uh, and then finally, the last one, cultural assimilation. This is Again, you know, interpreting data is, is uh, here you've got multicultural Canada, like this is our official ideology, even embraced by conservatives, the only conservative party on the planet that actually embraces a, uh, a, um, an idea uh, like multiculturalism. And, um, but the Canadians are actually so concerned about multiculturalism that they're worried that when immigrants are coming, especially from other parts of the world, not just Europe anymore, they're not integrating quickly enough. And the big concern is, is Muslims, and the big concern is what Muslim women wear, and uh, not so much the hijab, but the niqab, and there are about 100 niqabis in Montreal, and this has got the whole province focused on this issue. Uh, it looked like the election in Quebec was going to be fought on a charter that was going to deny niqabi or uh, people with uh, very wearing ostentatious symbols, actually Christian would be part of it, Jewish symbols and Muslim symbols, from having jobs in the public service. Uh, it looks like uh, the PQ talking so much about the potential of another referendum has uh, is, is actually changed the dynamic in that election. But that certainly is a concern about the integration of immigrants into uh, the Canadian society. So. Uh, violence. Okay, we'll get back to a, a value that 
I told you was uh, Im important in our tracking. Um, so this is violence is uh, part a normative, part of uh, life. It's no big deal. In the overall population in Canada, 7% think violence is normal, part of everyday life. I guess uh, these people play hockey, or I don't, I'm not sure where they're allowed to express their violence in our country. But if you put on skates, I guess it's OK in Canada. 16% uh, of the population in the United States think violence is normal. Uh, Canadian youth, 10%, so it's, it's a little higher. It's statistically probably insignificant. Uh, American youth, 27% of the population thinks that violence is normal and uh, it's no big deal. Uh, among uh, young uh, people, young uh, women in Canada, 8% think violence is normal. Young American women, uh, 20%. And then young men in Canada, 13 And young men in America, it's 34% who think violence is normal in everyday life. So. It can't just be computer games, because I can attest that Canadian young women, and particularly young women, men, are just as oriented to violent uh, media, uh, computer games, and so on. So there's something going on in, in each culture when it comes to orientation to violence. And uh, we can see fear of violence is, again, something that was uh, a big differentiator between the Canadians and the Americans. So you saw my patriarchy um, numbers. Uh, from 92 to 2000. Um, in 2004, the pattern continued, except in the case of Canada, it goes up 3%. We're now starting to see the effect of immigration in Canada, that we're taking immigrants from uh, er, uh, parts of the world where religious patriarchy, or, and sometimes it isn't religious, it's just patriarchy, uh, is stronger. And the first generation comes, they get into our samples, and they are saying the father should be the master in this house. Um, and you, you know, see movies like Bend It Like Beckham and so on, dad and mom kind of, dad particularly of traditional values. In some cases it leads to very tragic outcomes, but um, anyway, that's what you're seeing in Canada. In the U.S. you're, you're seeing uh, a continuing concern um, or uh, a belief uh, that the, uh, the father must be the, uh, the master in the house. And of course that carries on the police chief, the fire chief, the president and commander in chief when you're in a state of fear and potential war and so on, you look for men to perform their traditional role as warrior, as the protector of the tribe, of the family, and so on. But look at this, a dramatic uh, decline in patriarchy in our measure in 2012. So in eight years, we see a uh, decline. Canada, uh, at now 24%, again, immigration being a big factor. And looking at this 41%, I think what we're seeing here is the effect of the millennials. And uh, I guess uh, uh, Pew has just come out with a, a, a new book on, uh, I think, Paul Taylor on the future of America. And he particularly has a big f uh, focus on American millennials. And uh, this is a fascinating book. The values of millennials are much more egalitarian, much more multicultural. Uh, and much more open. The most dramatic change in the polling in the United States over the last number of years on social values has been the acceptance of same-sex marriage. It is a remarkable, remarkable change, and it, it is in the direction of where Canadians have been, you know, uh, for 10 or, or 20 years. So let's look at where demographic groups are on the map. This is for a little bit of fun, American men and American women. Men more toward survival of the fittest, women more toward fulfillment. Uh, Canadian men, Canadian women, again, not far apart, but down the map in the, in the uh, lower right quadrant. Uh, age groups in the United States, so the elders being more traditional, and then the boomers more into the idealism and autonomy, and then the young people over in exclusion and intensity, where they're having fun with materialism and hedonism and so on. Canadians, uh, the, our elders are <coughs> quite different, have much more traditional values. This led me to, in one book, to reflect upon the seniors, or what's called the silent generation, having very similar values. So my parents, uh, who you know came out, dad in the war, Second World War, and so on, come back, that, they, that there was very little difference between the, my cousins in Michigan and my parents in, in Bruce County in Ontario for the, the values that was you come back, 
you get a job, you work, you get a house in the suburbs, it's probably a bungalow, you get yourself a Chevy or a you know, Pontiac or something like that. And the whole concept of the, of the good life was very, very similar. But the break comes with the baby boomers, so Canadian baby boomers make a big break. Oh, and religion is another thing. Uh, the parents are going to church, at least pretending to believe and, and so on, and, and they do it mainly a lot of the reason they do it is that the community, they're more, uh, the community goes to church, you gotta go to church. You don't go to church, somebody's gonna say, is, is Florentine ill or, you know, Bill, what happened to Florentine? And so it, it's a community thing, and the boomers then have a, en masse, are rejecting religion, of course, particularly in Quebec. And you see also the young people in Canada closer to their parents than the young people in America who are, uh, have, have a, a greater distance uh, from, from their parents. Uh, these are the regions of the United States and where they are on the map. The ones the furthest down are New England and Pacific, so we've got Oregon, Washington, and, and California. Um, and then you've got the Canadian regions down here, BC being the most in the direction of, uh, uh, of uh, individualism and autonomy. Uh, Quebec over in this way, a little more toward uh, <coughs> exclusion and intensity. Um, if they're excluded, it'll be voluntary, I guess. They'll have to have a <laughs> referendum. Um, and, and this also tells me that if we ever want to expand the Canadian Empire, that I would have as candidates uh, New England. Uh, the Tories uh, left, and they left these people behind. But they, you know, And there are a lot of Canadians there as well. A lot of French Canadians went down into <coughs> New Hampshire, Vermont. And I think Oregon is great, Pinot Noir. And then we can go right down. I think Napa should also be part of Canada because the Cabernet Sauvignon there is almost as good as Okanagan. Um, uh, conservative Protestants in America, conservative <coughs> Protestants in Canada, not that different. Why? Their national uh, culture is not as strong as their religious ideology or their religious beliefs make them more similar in values. Mainline Protestants in America, mainline Protestants in Canada. So much more modern. In fact, these people, of course, are still debating the divinity of Christ and other issues. This is compulsory in the United Church of Canada that there's, everything is a question. They, they have no answers, but they have lots of questions. Uh, Catholics in America, Catholics in Canada, again, quite uh, distinct. Uh, people with no religion in America are Canadians. Uh, <laughs> basically, they're down here with the, with the Canadians. You know, it is actually the fastest growing belief system in America is the, moving, the move to uh, uh, agnosticism and atheism. Um, uh, Canadians with no religion are almost off the map. Uh, they're so uh, uh, modern. Uh, Republicans, uh, this is probably where you'd expect them to be, up the map with traditional values. Democrats right down the middle here of the autonomy and uh, uh, idealism quadrant. Canadian conservatives are closer to American Democrats than they are to American Republicans. Liberals in Canada, New Democrats in Canada, Greens in Canada, and the Bloc Québécois. Again, of course, because they're separatists, so they would want to be in the exclusion quadrant. Um, <coughs> so uh, we surveyed Canadians on how they would vote in the American election. That's 2% of New Democrats would vote for Romney, not two people. It may have been two people, and we just rounded it up. I don't know. Liberals, 8% would have voted for Romney. 1% in the bloc would have voted for him. 7% in green. Uh, Canadian conservatives would have voted for Obama 2 to 1. Here's the guy holding up our keystone, right? And uh, still, even in Alberta, they would have voted for Obama uh, over Romney. It's pretty remarkable, uh, 58 to 29% of conservatives. Uh, Obama over Romney. So where are the Americans headed in 2016? Well, if they keep going in the direction that we started and they go right into the autonomy and maybe uh, Hillary, who uh, seems to be uh, have a lock on the Democrat nomination, would be their choice. Uh, maybe Chris Christie, although he fell off a bridge on the Hudson River <laughs> recently, so we, we don't know whether he'll come to the surface and be reborn. Um, uh, then we have Ca uh, Calgary's uh, contribution to the American political system, uh, Ted <laughs> Cruz. <clears throat> and now his, you know this, his, his uh, 
His dad was a Cuban, right? And his mom was from Delaware. So this, actually, even though he's born in Calgary, he can still run for president. You can check your constitution book. He's okay. He doesn't have to worry about that. And if uh, the exclusion and intensity quadrant, if we start heading in that direction, then, of course, we do have a candidate who, uh, Arnie, of course, as the terminator, would be a perfect candidate to represent the people in that quadrant. So now we know that Canadians are avant-garde progressives. Um, we have some other dispiriting news for Americans, and that is Canadians are now wealthier than Americans. Now, this is, uh, was not our aspiration in, in 1867 to actually be wealthier. We just didn't want to be Americans. But as a result of the crash, you can see that and this is very interesting. So Americans earn more money than Canadians. It's just that the Canadians are like those squirrels that save their nuts in the winter, right? So we have a lot. Canadians have their money in real estate. And we don't have uh, mortgage interest deductibility, so there's a higher, far higher percentage of equity in people's houses. One in five American houses is still underwater. In other words, the mortgage loan is greater than the value of the house. So this, this uh, dents uh, the uh, uh, wealth of the Americans. So the, the uh, Canadians are up here, wealthier. This is net worth. This includes both your liquid assets as well as your, uh, as your house. And uh, now, of course, eventually America is going to get back, and uh, these numbers will cross again, and Americans at least will be uh, wealthier than Canadians someday. So that's uh, my update report, everyone, and I uh, thank you for your attention. And we can, David, we can throw it open now. Well, thank you. Before we throw it open, I have a question. Yeah. Um, on demographics, you touched it a little bit on how Canada was changing. It went up, and with the use of the immigrants, uh, paternalistic immigrants. Can you talk a little more about demographic differences in Canada and the United States and how that might shape some of these opinions and values? Yeah. Well, of course, um, <clears throat> the big demographic story in America is, is of course, the um, – and, and this I've, I've done a, a piece with Celinda Lake, a Democrat pollster, on, on big changes in, in Canada and the United States, particularly in the U.S. So. Celinda is seeing, first of all, the rise of the Hispanics, and I think the numbers you're going to see in the, world, the work that Pew is doing and others are doing is that you're, we're going to be looking at uh, nearly a third of the population in the future is going to have a Hispanic background. And, and the question was, will Hispanics bring their conservative, religious conservative values to the, to the voting booth, or will they bring their economic values as people who are uh, lower on the socioeconomic scale? And it turns out that they're bringing their attitudes towards um, uh, more positive attitudes towards the role of government and their greater concern about things like opportunity and poverty and so on. So the, dem the, the big story here, of course, mobilizing uh, black Americans has been pretty easy with Mr. Obama as the, as the candidate. Uh, mobilizing young Americans, of course, is another thing. The, the millennials being a dramatic, seeming to be, seemingly to be a dramatic difference. Theory there is that America is again becoming um, more, uh, better educated, uh, more multicultural, and you got people bumping into each other who are a difference uh, with, with everybody kind of being a minority rather than us versus them. When you have us versus them, it's, it's trouble. If, if everybody's a minority, then we're all in the same boat. And it therefore uh, makes people much more liberal. Now, we see this in Canada as well. So our cities, our multicultural cities, my city of Toronto, now the fourth largest city in North America. I don't know how we calculate what a city is, but that's what we now brag. Um, we brag about that and not who our mayor is, of course. Uh, but, you know, we've got, uh, so the fourth largest city, you know, five million in the greater Toronto area, half are foreign born. Uh, the closest city in America to be similar to that is Miami. And Miami, of course, is foreign born, but foreign born is of one group. They're, they're uh, Hispanics, right, and Cubans and, and Hispanics. Uh, with our, uh, with the Toronto, uh, you've got people from 150 countries all over the world. So it is a tremendous multicultural experiment in Canada. And, and there, but there are similarities in attitudes and values of American millennials and Canadian millennials. The other big demographic difference, of course, is Canada has Quebec. It has French Canadians. And this is a remarkable evolution from a church-dominated culture to a culture that, I don't know, Stéphane Dion uh, uh, jokes about this. He was a leader of the Liberal Party, and he's a, uh, uh, from Quebec, a French uh, Quebecer. And, and, uh, but he, he grew up in the 50s with his dad, <clears throat> and they love golf. So they have a golf on Sunday morning, 
and everybody was in church. And then they stopped going to church, and it meant that it was really difficult to get a tea time. So he actually lamented the radical change in orientation to religious authority that happened in the late 1950s and early 1960s. There's a whole story about how, why Quebec went in that way, but there are a lot of cases of Catholic countries sort of getting to a point and suddenly killing the pope or killing the bishop and then whoosh, they go the other way and they become almost anti-religion and they have this uh, secular orientation. The French are similar and, and France is very similar and, and, and to Quebec in this. Um, so you've got the demography, basically the French, English, um, and uh, the Hispanic, Hispanics rising. The other demographic group that Celinda <coughs> identifies in the United States are women, and particularly single women. Single women are the most strong group for the Democrats. They need some help. They, they, you know, survival of the fittest isn't going to work for them, and, and so they are people quite oriented to a more activist agenda that the government would take. Um, and I think, uh, so that's another group demographically, Hispanics, blacks, millennials, and women, particularly single women, as being part, a bigger part of the future, and the demography then being on the side of Democrats if they can mobilize these groups to vote, the most difficult of which is the millennials. And it's interesting that millennials in Canada, the United States, are singular, if the, if the boomers question the church, it looks like the millennials have questioned the state. And, and of course, they all, well, how are we going to get people back in the pews? Well, you, good luck. Uh, how do we get millennials back into the voting booth? Now, there are theories about how this is going to happen. They are delaying forming relationships and having babies a long time. So it's like we've started youth, you know, when they're eight or nine or ten, they look like they're getting, you know, mature, and particularly young women, men, much later, if ever, but anyway, uh, but they, they're mature. They're 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 becoming young people earlier, and they're extending it into their teens and into their twenties. I, th I think two thirds of millennials are now still staying at home. They're still at home, and a young woman now in America, I think it's probably age twenty-seven or twenty-eight. That's when she's having her first kid, and maybe only one, and a lot are not having any children. So, children, what do they do? Certainly, I know in Canada. <clears throat> until you have a kid, you really don't have a stake in civic culture. You don't have a stake in, in that local school, right, because you don't have a kid. And, and the medical uh, health care system becomes more <coughs> important to you as well. So there may be some evolution that once people get into their 30s and they start relying on public services, maybe they then get civically engaged. Uh, certainly we're hoping on that for that in Canada, whether or not that happens <coughs> in the United States or not, I don't know. But that was a... Uh, that was my demog demographic change in the two countries and how it may be affecting us. Okay, now questions from the audience and our fantastic intern in the back, Ryan, has a microphone, so wait for that because we're being recorded. Ryan, up here. Hi, Michael Nix. Um, really enjoyed this a lot. On your um, survey of the United States and, and Americans, David had some folks here about 10 years ago after Bush over Kerry. And it was this really interesting arc. You kind of looked at like a United States of Canada. It was the great wines of California, which now the new vineyard, I'm told, from my Silicon Valley buddy is Livermore. Okay. But Napa, Sonoma. But it was basically Canada or California north all across the southern tier of Canada. And then you came down to about right here. And that was all kind of blue secular, multicultural, mm -hmm. same-sex union back then, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Did your methodology, did you look at equal parts from all of the uh, American regions? Yeah, That's what, what I was questioning about because, mm -hmm. you know, we, we're, we're kind of seeing this national trend, especially on the coasts and around the Great Lakes where we lean more left. Mm -hmm. And then you got these big swaths through the Rocky Mountains, and then Dixie, yeah. where it's very, very red, and you know it's very, yeah. um, you know, more people go into the military, more people go to churches, and they go to more conservative churches. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm an Episcopalian, which is kind of like an Anglican. Yeah. Only we're slightly different because we don't speak as much Latin. Yeah. But you know that. So <coughs> your methodology there. How are you looking 
What it, we each did, different our weeks. samples were only <clears throat> 1,500 to 2,000 in each wave. So what we did to do the regional <clears throat> analysis <clears throat> for the book was to aggregate the three surveys. So we had 6,000 cases. And then what we did is break it down into regions. And we chose census regions of the United States. And then we looked at Canada. And what we found was exactly what I said here. You've got um, Washington up the coast, the Canadian coast, and down the west coast. Um, <clears throat> and that uh, sense with, with very similar values, Chicago would be up with the Canadians and so on. And uh, so that, that, that was very much a trend. And we, I looked at not only, and you look at that, you look, like the belief you can't be a good person unless you believe in God, that would correlate with it, religiosity would correlate it. The one that we love the best, because we do work with car companies, is, is a car a vehicle, a, a means to get from A to B, or is it a, a status symbol? And this highly correlates with uh, the car as uh, a status symbol is in the, in the, uh, the Republican states. And, uh, and, and, it's, and you just see, just like patriarchy goes from, in fact, that was, I had another slide that was a good one, it was all, this, all the Canadian, state, uh, Canadian provinces and the American states, and you've got patriarchy being the lowest in Quebec and the highest in Texas or somewhere, and then belief that the car is uh, a means to get from A to B is in Quebec is the highest, and then the uh, belief that the car is a, a status symbol is the highest in Texas, right? It's, it's, it's so, they, and, they, and they almost correlate uh, one to one throughout. So yes, the values, uh, now there have been others who talk about regions and you know, the, the Civil War, the slave okay. states, the South and so on, but clearly the um, urban, multicultural, better educated, these things highly correlate with more liberal, uh, progressive uh, attitudes. And, uh, and, uh, and the same thing is true in Canada. You, you asked me to explain Harper. Uh, you know, how, how does Harper become pr uh, Prime Minister of Canada? Uh, and, and essentially what he is, he represents the backlash against 50 years of elites leading the country. Um, <clears throat> and, and Quebec, together with Toronto and the, and the cities, kind of leading the country in a progressive direction. And uh, I'm, I'm actually doing a, an article now on crim crime and punishment <coughs> in Canada. How, what, what, how has this come about with Harper's Tough on Crime? And why is it playing so well? And it's playing so well because the public was never in favor of these very liberal progressive policies on the, on the treatment of criminals. We were always, we were always, um, 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 take capital punishment, 1976, parliament votes and a free vote uh, to abolish the death penalty in Canada. 75% of Canadians disagreed with that position, right? Um, Same-sex marriage, it's, it's, well, no, the abortion, we were quite divided on that. Parliament and its leaders didn't vote in 1990, uh, and so we decriminalized uh, uh, abortion. Uh, Same-sex marriage, it was, the, it was the judiciary that made its decision, the Supreme Court of Ontario that uh, gave us uh, same-sex marriage reading the uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms that Trudeau had given us in 1982. So elites had always been in advance of public opinion. Stephen Harper and Preston Manning before him said, you know, there's a lot of people who aren't going along with a lot of the stuff that these people are shoving down our throat. They need representation. And they build, a, they start in the rural areas, the areas that were um, uh, opposed <laughs> to these sorts of things, but they were very smart in not picking issues that would really get them into a lot of trouble. So what issue did they uh, choose? The long gun registry. So we still have uh, strict controls on handguns and all that sort of thing, but long guns are, you know, in, in the rural areas, and most people use them to shoot animals and not other humans. It happens every once in a while that, you know, spouses will use a rifle. But, uh, and, and so that was a symbol. But they haven't gone near uh, the death penalty and they haven't gone near abortion, which is interesting. That's why you see conservatives down there with Democrats. So it's, it's, it's very interesting on what Harper is giving the Canadians. It's kind of Tea Party light in a Canadian context is sort of what, what I think we're, we're getting here. And then the parts of America. Follow up and then we'll go to Antonia and Jeff. Uh, just a quick follow up on that. Yeah. You might want to look at Thank you. A uh, quick follow-up on that. You might want to look. Uh, no, another uh, friend of mine has done research on Giuliani and the decreasing crime on the New York City subway. Yes. 
It's gone, it went from over 100 reported uh, crimes on the subway mm -hmm. to less than 10 under Giuliani. Right. I'm, I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying that I think for someone like you that's looking at law and order is what you're looking at Harper. Yeah. Um, Giuliani did a, um, he, he became very popular with that type of thing. Right. And cleaning up the subway and that kind of thing. Incarceration rates are, are another fascinating thing. I'm working with a guy named Tony Dube, who's a cr criminologist. <clears throat> And there was a time in which Canadians and Americans were the same in terms of incarceration, about 125 per 100,000 incarcerated. Uh, Canada stayed at about 125, even with the reforms that uh, Harper has brought in, because there's resistance among the judiciary and among the provinces uh, to throwing everybody in the clink. Americans are now at 700 per 100,000. So it's just, and, and this highly correlates again with some of the things I was doing in Fire and Ice showing the difference. So moralism is another thing. <coughs> you know, is, is there a, are there good people? Is this life about finding out who are the good people and who are the bad people? Or is this life about discovering the good and bad in each one of us and finding a way of pulling out the good even in someone who does something bad? And again, there's, if you want to, if, again, caricatur caricaturing the two cultures, you know, one is a morality tale in which you know you establish moral superiority, you wait for provocation, and you blow them away. And it has worked very well in Hollywood for about 100 years and will continue to do so. And that's, uh, or is it about, oh no, that it's, it's not about blowing away the bad guys, it's about going halfway, and everybody's in your family, we have different children, and we try to draw out the best in junior and the best in the, you know, our daughter and all of that, and treating every, so who is your community is another huge question. Robert Reich just wrote a thing about, uh, an article, very interesting article about the sorting of America into where is your school? What is your school? And you move to where you have a good public school. And then you get away from where the bad schools are. Well, this to me, for an American, I think would be just incredible. When you think of public education and its role in helping Americans achieve the American dream, when you get people moving into, uh, into places where the schools are not good schools and those kids are not going to go to college or university, right? And so who is in our community? Who do we help in our community? So I think one of the, the underappreciated, uh, I don't know whether David in your book or, uh, this comes about it or not, but looking at public education in the two societies and where it's evolved. In my city of Toronto, we have one school board. And the, and the poorest neighborhood and the richest neighborhoods are supported by the same tax base. And the teachers in the poorest neighborhood are paid the same as the teachers in the richest neighborhood in our city of five million people. That has got to be one of the interesting differences when you, could, let's say, compare Toronto to Chicago, I won't mention Detroit, or, or, or you know, other major cities, and what's happened to public education in the United States. And, and how important that institution is in social mobility and the, and the ability of, a, of somebody in the bottom quintile to actually end up in the next quintile or the next one or the next one. And social mobility clearly is more, <clears throat> is, is more likely to happen in Canada, certainly in, in Northern Europe, than it is in the United States. So is America becoming the country you left 200 years ago? Well, since we're into overtime, um, why don't I take the three questions quick questions and then we'll have Michael answer them. So Antonia and then Jeff and then Melina. Um, have you seen any correlation between attitudes toward patriarchy and Williams' willingness to vote for female candidates? For example, Canada has a high number of women premiers and the United States you know, kind of who knows. Yeah. Do you have any correlation you're seeing in your studies with that? Okay. Jeff? Yeah. The thesis seems to be that we are growing further apart rather than closer together. Jeff, can you use the microphone just because we're recording? Okay. And yet the, the data on the millennials in both countries seem to be that they were much closer aligned. So speculate on what is it that is driving this greater divergence in values. Okay, and Melena? And as a specialist of Quebec, Melina Santoro from Georgetown University, um, I'm interested in getting your take, um, your more recent take on Quebec as the, in your, in your 2003 book, you called it the most postmodern mm -hmm. um, society. And I'd like to see if that's still true in what you're finding given the recent debates in Quebec. Okay, okay. Um, 
So the, the uh, orientation to patriarchy and, and uh, women, how women are doing in uh, elected office, is there a correlation? Um, I suspect so. Uh, the most patriarchal uh, province in the Canada is Alberta. They've got a woman premier. Um, uh, it's, it's maybe the most patriarchal <laughs> part of Canada. It's still less patriarchal than the most liberal place in the United States, which would be the New England states around, you know, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, and so on. Um, you would think that that would, you know, highly correlate with, uh, with, with women being in elected office. Problem with Canada is so big, you know, a woman in Vancouver, you know, she's 35, got a kid, you're going to get her to run and go and serve in Ottawa, I mean, and, and ruin her life. So part of it, I think, is geography. I've often envied, if I were a feminist, I'd envy those Danes where almost any woman in the country can get on the subway and, and go to the parliament. Uh, but that would be another book, is how difficult it is then for women to get into public life and, and again, given the geography of the nation and so on. But uh, clearly Canada has a lot. I think we have things like uh, parental leave. I don't know how widespread that is in the United States, but that's something that we're moving on in Canada and so on. So we, we are, and of course, early childhood education is important. Uh, I don't know, again, whether or not this is coming about in Canada. We've done it in Ontario. So we're, we're and that would help women and so on. So that, that I think Canada is more progressive in that, that sense with, with its policies. On the <clears throat> question of millennials, I think, I think what, uh, uh, American millennials, I, but, well, American and Canadian millennials have a lot in common, except the Canadian millennials are further along the, uh, the progressive, um, you know, uh, 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 direction <coughs> of social change and more liberal and more multicultural. Uh, but essentially, American millennials are headed in that direction. It's just a matter of somebody politically uh, motivating them. Now, you can have, you know, um, <coughs> very progressive uh, people and we have it in Canada as well, when we segment young people, I mean, we've got everything from autonomous post-materialist to um, aimless dependents. And the aimless dependents are young men who have, uh, two, two thirds of them are young men who in the past might have got a job in a resource industry or in manufacturing or somewhere, and today there's no job for these guys. You've got to have an education. So they are lost. And they uh, and they're they're a significant uh, uh, problem in each society where you have young men. In fact, to look at any society, what are the young men aged 15 to 30 doing? And if you've got half of them unemployed, you're going to have trouble because they're at an age where they're going to figure out well who who in fact is uh, who's to blame? Who do I and and you get you get a lot of racism, you get a lot of. Uh, uh, and then you've got violence as a potential way of expressing how alienated you are and so on. So each, each society has these aimless dependent youth. It's just that uh, in, in the United States it would be a larger proportion uh, of the population. But uh, in terms of the, the successful educated millennials, Canadians and Americans, there's a lot in common between the two of them, just as there is between idealistic Canadian baby boomers and American idealistic American baby boomers. As for Quebec, yes, it remains sort of at the leading edge of um, where, where Quebec is, is going, I mean, on the same-sex marriage and, and uh, liberalism and tolerance for the other, the one area where Quebec is, seems very traditional to us is its, is its identity. And, and there, Quebec looks more like Europe. And you get problems when you have insecure majorities. Insecure majorities can be trouble because they don't know who they are. And so you look at the Europeans, I'm a German or I'm a Brit or I'm a Frenchman and so on, and then you've got all these foreigners coming in. And, and it then, they, didn't, they haven't established themselves, at least in the last 10,000 years, as multicultural places. So they're trying to, they're, 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 they're finding themselves maybe being um, homogenized, social change is going on, and, uh, and so I think national identity becomes important to them, and they uh, kind of look at the other. And the other in France are the, are the uh, Arabs the, uh, from the Maghreb, from uh, North Africa, and they do find them to be, uh, you know, you can come and become French, but you live in a suburb somewhere out there, and you're excluded. Um, and and uh, so Quebec, uh, the insecure majority is, of course, French Quebec who is afraid of this Anglosphere that they're surrounded with, the culture comes from the states and so on, and then they see the Muslims coming, and the Muslim women dressed like 
The nuns were in the 50s, and they thought they got rid of that. People walking around, you know, it used to be like penguins. Now they look like they're walking under tents and so on. And, and, and they're saying this is, this is a threat to our society. And the reason they feel that is that they're insecure. The reason that's not a problem in Toronto is that we're quite secure in the fact that uh, we're now part of, the, uh, of a multicultural uh, mosaic. The Anglo-Saxon man has been relegated now to a position in the museum. Uh, under beside Tyrannosaurus rex and, and so on, and, you know, as and we were once a dominant species and now we are a joke, and we accept it ironically as long as you know people give us reasonable service at restaurants. <laughs> well, Michael, thank you very much for giving us an update on your studies, <laughs> and I'd like to thank the audience for indulging this extra time and have a great day. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, thank you. What's your name?